I'll bet you love chamber music. Well, guess what? We do too. We're so happy that you're with us this afternoon. There are thousands and thousands of people all over the world, all ages and backgrounds, who just love to play chamber music. ACMP, Associated Chamber Music Players, is all about connecting people together to play, friends and strangers. Today, we're bringing the world together through music and the magic of technology. I'm Jennifer Clark, Executive Director of ACMP, live from the National Opera Centre in New York. Thank you so much for joining us. In our live stream masterclass today, we'll be experiencing, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be meeting award-winning uh, public quartet, who are going to be leading the uh, workshop with two uh, great student ensembles, uh, the One O'Clock Manor String Quartet and Augmented Four. Uh, preparing two chamber music pieces, Piet Sola's Oblivion for String Quartet and Prokofiev's String Quartet No. 2, Second Movement. Public Quartet will share their tips and insights, and wherever you are in the world, you can participate through Facebook and, your, and uh, give your comments and feedback. That's ACMP, Associated Chamber Music Players. We'll be visiting the live chat feeds after each of the two masterclasses. Our session will end with a performance of Public Quartet uh, with three short pieces by Meredith Monk, Jesse Montgomery and, of course, Piet Zola. So now I'd like to move the action to Public Quartet and introduce violist Nick Rebel, who will take us from here. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Nick Rebel, founding violist in Public Quartet. Uh, the quartet's been together for about eight years uh, here in New York City, and uh, we're super excited to bring this event to you, whether you're here in the room or watching in your pajamas at home. Um, <clears throat> uh, the way this masterclass is going to work is you're going to hear these wonderful young groups play some music. They're going to give a little performance. And then we're going to offer our feedback, our thoughts, um, things, that we might, things that we think might uh, help the performance. And so we're going to work with the kids. And, um, as you're listening, you might have questions. You might be wondering, well, how do they do that? Or what happens if this thing happens? And if you have a question, please write it in on the um, ACMP Facebook page um, or their, uh, their Twitter. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to present the One O'Clock Manus String Quartet. Um, they're students at the Manus uh, Preparatory Division. And we have Marcus Lee and Brandon Phillips on violin. Jack Crisano Viola. And Niall Sauer on cello. And they're going to be playing Oblivion by Astor Piazzolla. Enjoy. Thank you. 
ha ha ha. And there's this feeling, you know, that, that how you how you lead, right? So you can. There are many different ways that we can set up this group. Um, can you just play the beginning few couple bars? Great. Now can we add the inner voices? Or the, sorry. The violins. The violins, yeah. Score in front of me. Okay, great. First two violins and cello. Can, um, I'm going to push you around a little bit with my bass line, okay? And let's see if we can flow together, okay? You're setting the field, right? These two dancers are coming on stage. Maybe the lights are changing. The audience is quieting down. What is the feeling that you're trying to conjure before the melody comes in? Mist. Mist? Smoke, like an atmosphere. Ooh, I like that. Okay, so how do you think we can achieve a misty, sounds kind of like mysterious, right? Misty, smoky atmosphere. Um, what do you think it would take to achieve that kind of quality? Like, what does a smoky sound sound like on your instrument? Soft. Soft? Yeah. Maybe a little farther up on the fingerboard? Yeah, and it's um, smooth. Yeah. A little wispy. You know what I like about what smoke looks like when you're watching smoke rise? It's, it's actually really complicated, looking, right? It doesn't. Yeah. It's not like a solid object. Every part of it is swirling around and moving. And so you guys are doing a great job of making your sound smooth. But I wonder if it's too simple. Like, could it be more dynamic? Even though it's piano, it repeats four times. So what if each one of those bars does something a little different? Yeah. Why don't you try just experimenting with the four bars, even if it's not together. Do whatever makes you, you feel passionate about in that moment and try to follow each other. If it's not totally together, it's okay. If this is the time where you can really just like let loose and then work your way back. So you can really, you know, experiment with how loud you play each piece. Can you try that one more time? Uh, from the beginning. Small shape. 
And then you guys just now are starting to have a bigger shape across all four of ours. That's a big shape. So don't get rid of your small shape. Keep the small shape happening, but add it to big shape. Does that make sense? Yes. One of the things that you, I notice you're doing is you're kind of doing a great job of coming in off the beat. Boom. Boom. But I wonder if one of your small shapes could be boom. So you start really quiet and then you crescendo up to that F. Okay, let's go, let's go from the beginning and go on this time. So I want you to think about uh, what we just, uh, sorry, what's your name again? You'll Jack. Jack. I want you to think about the stuff that we just worked on with them and see if you can immediately apply it to your uh, viola, beautiful viola melody. See how expressive and uh, dynamic you are. Tempo. 
Do you like it more? Or less? It's okay if you like it less. No, it's good. Okay, good. Slightly different feel. Slightly different feel. Okay. You can go back to the old tempo anytime you want. So, part five. <coughs>
takes the music on a turn. And a lot of times your chord changes are very quick and then you go back to this, this sort of long C drone underneath. Um, so I think you can really push the ensemble through the crescendo.
So the cello is playing arco, which makes the whole thing sound much fuller. And I'd like to talk a little bit about your solo now. So sort of the, the same idea that Nick was saying with the, with the viola solo, really carrying through, right? Can you go right before, where is, where do you start this? I should you need to pick up into the, the four, three, five, three, six. Yeah. Six. Or 29 or something? Oh, like I should go 29. Oh, three, four, oh. five, six, seven, eight, 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 that have come in through the interwebs. And um, I guess these are directed for us, but Janina, Curtis, if you want to chime in, come up on stage and answer these two. Um, so Cynthia says, they are talking a lot about the emotion of the music. That's great. What's the best tip for translating emotion to playing? Um, <laughs> Cynthia, that is a fantastic question. <laughs> um, so the, the question is many layers deep. You can't answer it in a sentence, and you can't answer it even a single paragraph. Um, honestly, it's, it's just about the, the sort of um, years of experience playing a chamber music. But one thing that I will say is, in terms of string playing, the shape of the note is extremely important. So if you've ever listened to um, like a MIDI strings on a computer, it sounds really basic. It sounds kind of terrible. Um, but you can actually make that melody sound good using different shapes. Um, so for instance, that's one shape. That's another shape. And there's infinite shapes. So if you're shaping your tone and you're shaping your, um, your phrases and you're then connecting them, that's a really great place to start with how to introduce emotion into your music. Do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I, especially as string, string players, because we have the ability to really make our, our, our sound literally spins, right? 
right? And so things that, that help this are the way we use our bow and the way we vibrate. Um, and for me, if I'm playing something, you know, emotion is a pretty wide word because there could be a lot of emotions, angry, but um, I guess I'm feeling the tango mood right now. Um, so for just what we were talking about with this piece specifically, we were talking about adding vibrato and the way you really pull the sound out of the instrument. So if I'm trying to be, if I'm trying to play a, a note and I really want to feel like it's stretched, I wouldn't be like, right? Because that's very fast motion. Um, so if I would think about, if I was trying to pull the sound out to have this sort of like from the gut feeling in tango, I probably would a lot slower. And think about the kind of vibrato I wanted to use. So am I going to use like this sort of even vibrato or a really fast or really slow? Okay, all of these have different sort of qualities. Um, and you can change the way you vibrate within a note. You can have the same vibrato for the whole phrase. Um, and so that's something that string players really have that uh, I think sets us apart when we're trying to be emotional because we can be endless in our sound. I mean, we do have to go back and forth, it's annoying. But other than that, um, the speed at, at which you use your bow and the speed at which you use your left hand counts for a lot. Um, and a lot of times, like, when, if I'm really angry, you know, it's like, or something like that. It's, it's a different speed and a different feel on the left hand. Okay, next question. Um, so, when do the middle voices have a chance to lead the ensemble? <laughs> <laughs> At all times. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a lot of different um, approaches to playing in a chamber ensemble. Um, one is that you know the classic, which is way faded out at this point, is the first violin leads everything, and you know this is the first violin, you know, you know, give the tempo. But <clears throat> I think a lot of times the music really comes from the inside of the group, mm -hmm. just like you guys were speaking of, like, oh, what if you start as soft as possible and lead the phrase this way this time, and let the melody react to that. And it becomes a very organic process of listening and feeling, and like, oh, what, how, how much speed is the cello using, and how much uh, weight, and how close to the bridge is the first violin, and, and so you're kind of like mishing, matching the, all the sounds together. So I think at all times is the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For instance, especially also to, like between rehearsal and performance or a run through or something. If, if the group decides on a certain way to play something, like for instance, if the inner voices have a rhythmic thing, like in the tango, there's so many ways to play that, that if that person is inspired to play it more rhythmically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end the end you have a first violinist who has great ears, then you can you can interact musically. The, the first violinist will be like, oh, I didn't expect that. And it's sort of a wonderful moment where you then, like, you, you're surprised by your own, the, the sound coming from your own group, and you can adjust right in that moment. Try it one more time a little more lyrically. Okay. <laughs> where long notes are followed by short ones, yet where the bow is in relation to either the tip or frog really affects the dynamic shadings. So I think the question is basically, how do you, um, how do the, the short notes affect the long notes in the context of the tip or the frog? Okay, so. <laughs> there we go. Um, this is sort of what I was talking about with the violist at the beginning, where the melody, most melodies, you can boil them down into a few long notes. So, um, I don't really care about, those are just steps in the staircase to get from to 
So really the melody, the structure of the melody is actually and the it's just a way to get there. So that's really useful information because if you're spending a ton of attention on these, it's going to actually take away from the flow of the melody. So me knowing that and are the main melody notes, I might I'm going to have that in my ear already before I play the little notes, and that's going to really affect um, just how the, how the melody flows. So I think that's all the time we have for for the first group. Um, I would I would like to introduce. If they're ready, hopefully, um, the next group, which I'm very proud to present because it's actually the group that I coach uh, in Connecticut. It's one of the regular coaching groups um, from the Talent Education Suzuki School. I'm uh, really proud to present uh, Augmented for String Quartet. <laughs> second movement of Prokofiev's second string quartet. And uh, we've been working uh, together, me and them, for about five minutes. This might be the sixth year that we've been coaching together, fifth year maybe. So um, I'm really happy uh, we get to perform uh, yearly recitals uh, a couple times a year. And just in January, they were able to play both the first and the second movements from the Prokofiev string quartet among a couple other groups that I coach that I'm also very proud of. So without further ado, I'll go to four. Thank you very much.
think there's something to this music that is in between, actually. I mean, first of all, there's kind of like two or three different sections, right? There's the opening, which is very, you're in your low register playing very <coughs> chorale-like writing. And then there's that section in the middle, right, where you're going duck, 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 forever, um, right, which is very jumpy. And then we go back to this chorale thing, right? So it's kind of got this weird mat, like, you know, you, you're, it's almost nostalgic in a way, where you're kind of, <coughs> you're in this dark place, and then you suddenly, like, remember some bright, magical thought, and then you come back. So I think when we could talk about making each one of those sections even more distinct as themselves, and then, you know, seeing how they, how they flow. So you can really get into the flow of the, music, the musical aspect. This piece, that's one thing I, I can see. You guys, you guys have done some really awesome work. This is a hard piece, really, really beautiful. Thanks, John. Is it scary playing this piece? <laughs> <laughs> nah. A little bit, yeah. What's scary about it? It's just really odd. It's really odd. There's a lot of pieces <laughs> that are very awkward. They go way up high on the violin. You've got these contrasting rhythms that don't feel like they should line up. And then it's supposed to sound like a beautiful chorale and like a playful, jumpy dance. So trying to, you know, you guys have done the hard work clearly in this. And so now we need to get you to definitely have a little bit more fun with it. So one thing you're doing a fabulous job of is dynamics. Um, I'm hearing a lot of really great dynamic contrasts. So I'm wondering, within those dynamics, if we can find different colorations of sound. So the first one would be at the beginning. So in the beginning, if this was setting the stage for a play, what would be happening? Yeah. Cool. So in this stage, there would be like chairs and stuff. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. That's I get what I asked for exactly. Um, but if it was, if, if what would the content of the play in the opening scene be? Well, it would kind of be like introducing everything. Introducing everything, and would it, it with that introduction would it be creepy? Would it be um, would it be exciting? Would it be sprightly? Would it be mysterious? What do you think? Or something different? It's kind of dark. It's dark. Yeah. Um, so if it's dark, would we want a very like bright sound? No. <laughs> okay. Good. So what kind of a sound do we want? Do we want a thick sound? More airy. Do we want an airy sound? More okay. airy. Okay, great. So let's try the beginning again. And really think, really feel if we can get it both more airy and then these kind of, we all have these. Maybe within the airy, it can be a little bit more lurching. You know what lurching means? Yeah, so it's something, and you guys each have it and pass it around. So if it can feel like, you know, footsteps getting closer and closer as you all join, that's soft. Try it. Let's do that one more, one more time. So one thing is as you're starting, that was a beautiful sound, by the way. It was really clear and nice. So I wonder if you can make not such a nice sound to start and really sneak in, maybe a little closer to the feet of the board. Yeah. That's so much better. Um, I think 
but as a violinist, it can be very difficult to play on the e high on the E string and make a lurching sound. It's kind of like nobody wants that. Anyway. <laughs> Actually, let's do that one more time. I'm going to play with you guys. For the time. different so that your, your sound tells the story.
Obviously, has the melody here, and you guys are pretty, you're just like repeating yourselves over and over again. Right? Um, one thing I find when, when I'm playing a melody is if the accompaniment is, is, still, is still underneath me and supporting my sound, but constantly kind of like helping me along. Like, it's kind of like when you're having a conversation with someone and then. You, they're like nodding. <laughs> it's helpful, right? So, as you, as they're, as, as she's playing her beautiful melody, which sounds awesome, um, you kind of like, oh, I see where you're going, and you're going with her. It, it's helpful, and it makes it so that it's like a team effort as opposed to like just, just me. But that was uh, that you did that that time. It was amazing. What's the first odd, awkward? What's the most awkward? thing you've played so far? Other than, I mean, not technically, but musically. What's the most awkward <laughs> harmony or rhythm or something that, you, that you've encountered up until this point in the piece? There's one person that has a really weird note, <laughs> for real, like a seriously weird, weird note. Well, I don't know. A lot of them for many instruments, symphonies, piano sonatas, concertos, blah, 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 a lot of flute sonatas. Um, he wrote some piano pieces called Sarcasms. So I don't know if, I don't know if you guys have very sarcastic, so if you remind me of extremely sarcastic sense of humor, unfortunately. Um, but this is it's kind of like a weird, you're playing, uh, so it's bar, uh, check this out, bar 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, or 4 after 19, if you have those big numbers. Yeah. Can we just hold, just everybody find, just play your first note there. And just hold it. You don't come in yet. Actually, can we go the three after 19? And then when you get to that bar, hold that note. Okay? So can we start from the third bar of 19? It's right where we start. So that's a weird note, right? So I think what'll make it come out even more is if you know it's coming and you take your sound and rub it against his, right? So it, it feels like, oh, it's that good kind of wrong. <laughs> okay, can we, start, can we start from 19 and really bring that out? So you can just kind of like smear through that. Make it as wrong as possible. So you're, now you're <laughs> think about do you have a yeah. You know, the paper? cello comes in and it's like E major. Right, right exactly. Oh. It's like no, first of all, I'm sorry. What's wrong with you? <laughs> what did you have for lunch? Um, think of, do you have a favorite teacher? Do you have a least favorite teacher? <laughs> this is what you want to say to your least favorite teacher. Can we start from 19 and just like go for it? Same thing. That was awesome. And what I really liked about that was you started from this pretty <coughs> place. You were slightly in the fingerboardish area. And it's not just my face that's getting nasty. It's also the sound, right? It's a little more floating at first. It's getting actually more compact. 
Right. And this is a great example of that question that was asked, is when can the inner voices manipulate the sound? This is it. This Go. is your chance. One more time from 19. That good kind of wrong. <laughs>
Like if I talk like this and each word is like a rope, that's what makes something sound robotic because there's nothing connecting the words, right? Right, there's stuff in between. So can you try the same thing, bring out the offbeats and then see what happens in between each note. Lead with your bow, with your sound. Very 
pretty and somewhat mechanical. So I'm so glad you said clunky, and I'm so glad you said ballerina bear, because that's capturing that sort of silliness. So now we have to bring that silliness into the music. I think, should we just try it with that image of, yeah. are you the ballerina bear? <laughs> <laughs> try it. See if you can be even more ballerina bearish. Monkey. Right at 21, yeah. You guys are like the elves trying to get out of the way of the ballerina bear. <laughs>
more energetic? Is it does it feel comfy or not comfy or difference? It, yeah, it, and you know, like you said, you're a ballerina bear. <laughs> so you're not supposed to look pretty. You're supposed to look kind of funny. So you know, if it's not like totally clean, who cares? It has that energy. And sort of the same thing here, I hear. Very, very clean. It's fantastic. It sounds like Mozart. Controlled freedom. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's try that section with everybody now. And as since we, I think this might be one of the last things we do. So as you continue, look for those accents. You have these random accents on those high E's. Um, boom. A. Right. D. What's the other awkward thing about this this passage? Rhythmically. Yeah, it sounds in two, but it's actually in, it's written in three, right? So you can just look for, remember what we talked about with the melody, what the, where you accent things can really lead or bring out a character. So when you have an accent on that down, it's like, this is it. Okay. <laughs> and, and you guys can, you know, support that. So look for ways to accent and bounce off each other. Uh, let's start from 22, right on 22. for Twitter and at ACMP Chamber Music for Facebook. You can write in your questions right now and uh, we might be able to address them um, in this session. So Eric asks, the interweaving of voices in this movement is so complex for Govia 2. How do you decide balance? Who should come to the front? Who should remain in the background? And how do you hand off between players with balance changes? Well, they were talking a lot about bringing expressivity in in a way that matches what they think the music should do. So for instance, ballerina bear, or clunky, or something like that. Um, really going to those, those places, like emotionally and mood-wise, even in a part that seems accompanimental, will drastically affect the texture. And if you can really get into the character of each part individually, even if that's an accompaniment, which by itself might not make any sense. When you put it together, 
it's automatically going to make more sense, and that's going to be a, the best place to decide balance. Um, not to decide, but to work on balances is, is you know, once each sort of role has been established. And um, if you're not sure of how to decide that, just experiment. Like, just literally say, okay, you're going to play piano as well, you're going to play piano, mezzo forte, forte, and just do it all the way, all the combinations, and see which one um, sounds best. Is, uh, makes the most sense. Do you guys have anything to add to, that, to add to that? How do you decide balance? Who should come to the front? Who should remain in the background? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, question from Tiffany. Uh, love your advice to breathe out when playing certain passages. Can you recommend ways of practicing and or incorporating breathing into playing? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, and so important because I think so many of us um, who are singers or wind players really never think about our breathing. Um, and some of those times where you're feeling really nervous or like you go into a concert and you feel lightheaded, it's often because you're holding your breath. So I think the best time is just to think about while you're practicing, you know, where am I breathing? You know, a, a singer or a wind player would really like mark out the breaths in their part. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to do that, but be aware of, of when you breathe in, when you breathe out, how slow is your breath, how many counts, you know, are you taking, you know, deep, full breaths, you know, taking shallow breaths, because all of those things can really help um, put you in touch with your body, which can translate to where you are when you come to play this. Um, I think it's also helpful, you know, in terms of cueing, a breath can show um, a lot. Um, and, you know, you've seen people probably who overbreathe, um, but, you know, it's really, you know, it's a personal thing. I, I have a lot of close friends who practice um, yoga, uh, and that helps um, a lot, uh, I think. Uh, but really, it's a personal thing and something to experiment with. I think a lot of times it feels like kind of like extra, like I'm just trying to learn these notes right now. <laughs> uh, and, and so breathing feels like breathing has nothing to do with like playing. You know. But uh, first of all, it does. It just, it's this automatic kind of restfulness and ease that you can coordinate your body with. And one way to make it feel like it's still part of an efficient practice, like it's not an extra thing you're doing, is to potentially breathe as you're trying to figure out what the phrase is. So your breath and your gesture is what ca you know, causes the, ten the tension comes in and then it releases, or maybe I want to hold my breath now. And so there's no sense of wrong or right breathing. And just like you know, you're trying to figure out where, where the direction of the phrase is and let it affect your breathing. And that also helps it, the, the musicality get in touch with your technicality. I think a lot, for me personally, a lot of the breathing related things are physical. So, um, as a, I don't know how it applies to cello, but as a violinist or violist, you're holding the instrument here, kind of on your shoulder, kind of with your hand, sort of supported by your chin and your jaw. A lot of times it feels really good to secure this with just a massive amount of tension, which is really not good for you. <laughs> and so one of the things that I work on personally is to just, like I literally practice open strings while I breathe. So I, I might breathe one in and one out per bow. And why this is challenging is because it physically changes the position of the instrument on your body. So your, your collarbones will expand, your ribs will expand. And as a string, as a violin or viola, that can be really unnerving to feel this happening while you're playing when you're trying to nail all this tricky stuff over here. So, um, if you can notice your, if you're, if you feel like you're having patterns of not breathing, like you, you just don't, you're not connected to your breathing when you're playing. I would really recommend starting your practice with just long bows while breathing, and just noticing how breathing actually physically affects the placement of your instrument on your body. Once you get comfortable with that, um, then bringing something like an exhale to a chamber music situation, it's not going to feel like that extra step. It's not going to feel like an additional thing. It's actually going to enhance your emotion, which is going to communicate some kind of energy to the other people in the group. I do an exercise with the cello. I think we're saying it's, it's a little different for the upper strings. We have the advantage of weight and gravity with our instruments. 
Um, so a lot of times I just will put the metronome on 60 to the quarter note and practice the breathing and doing circles. So it's um, me breathing in and then out. And I find it very nerve wracking breathing in, in a cue because you just, you feel so tense. So practicing actually breathing and putting the bow on the string will help with what Janina was talking about because a lot of times, especially if you have to play soft, the tendency is to, you know, and it's, it can be so hard to battle that because it takes an immense amount of control and especially if you're a little nervous, um, but if you really practice breathing, it'll become a part of your, the, your wings, or the physicality of moving with your instrument. We actually were playing um, a really wonderful string quartet by Meredith Monk um, called String Songs, which we're going to be performing um, at the Washington Performing Arts at the end of the month. And one of the movements is called Obsidian Chorale. It's the third movement. It's a, literally a chorale. Nobody has any rhythm. Everyone's in perfect rhythmic unison for the whole piece. Um, the whole movement is just one page uh, on the score. So uh, it's, it's very short, but it's very slow. And you kind of imagine just this like hardened lava. It's just black. <laughs> it's barely moving. And so as a quartet, we have to feel both like free to move together, to change, not to get stuck like when it's quiet, but also to bring out that quality of just it just sits there and it doesn't really do that much. And one of the things that we've been experimenting with um, in rehearsal is different ways of cueing and breathing into the next note. And, that, and so if you're having like, in any kind of musical situation, if you're having physical feelings of like awkwardness, like you don't know how to coordinate your movements with each other, um, cueing is a good way to start, like, so like they can tell funk to play there. But if you combine that with breathing, that makes a huge difference. So, um, <clears throat> Can we just demonstrate something? Let's do an A minor chord. <laughs> okay, it's a joke. Um, so let's start down bow, piano, and then two beats, and we'll just go up bow. So I'm, the first time, I'm not going to breathe or cue or anything, okay? So now I'm not going to breathe, I'm going to hold my breath, but I am going to cue. <laughs> okay, now we're all going to breathe and cue together. One of the things that helps in chair music is and like what Curtis was saying, where the old school, the first violinist is the leader, and we bow down to the first violinist. They tell you where to play. It's, um, it's not very inviting. And so in order to have like a real kind of connected chamber music experience, it's great to, for everybody to attempt to match the sort of kind of movements, like especially during cues and breathing. So we're all going to cue and breathe this A minor chord. Because you just feel connected, like both physically and musically, you feel connected to each other. You start to trust each other, even in a high pressure kind of situation. Anything else to add? Okay, cool. Um, during the last Q and A, <clears throat> Nick addressed the dynamic shaping of melodies. But how can members of the ensemble use timbre to enhance the feeling of a passage? We've got two minutes. <laughs> Go. <laughs> um, I think we, we can go for it. Um, uh, we've talked in, in both um, coaching today, we've talked a lot about bow placement. 
where if your bow is over the bridge, you have, can have more of a soltasto sound as you get closer to the bridge. was describing in, in the melody how you are you're using your bow to change the timbre of the melody so if you start you know you start on with one sort of floaty sound difference in the timbre and that's one way of spinning the sound and the other way is of course um, we said before with the vibrato if your vibrato is really fast it's moving the sound at a much quicker pace if it's wider then the sound waves are, are fatter um, and so I think bow, bow placement has a lot to do with the with the timbre and a lot of it is is a rich or an airy sound and it's on, on a spectrum I mean, there's the big three, right? There's the, that's called contact point, so you know, where the bow is in contact with the string. Then there's the amount of bow that you use. So, for example, if you're playing at the fingerboard, it's kind of like this whispered, like, oh, what's going to happen sound. But it, like, I can get the same. It's not much louder. I'm using a lot more bow. But so it's just a soft, it's a different kind of sound, it doesn't have as much tension in it. So there's the amount of bow that you use, and then there's also the weight. So how deeply into the string versus right, so you can sink in. So there's the big three, weight, speed, and contact point. Cool. Well, um, <laughs> we're going to move on to a couple of pieces that we brought for you today. We're going to play for you. Um, the first one is called Buddha Dolls. Uh, it's been in our rep. We were just talking about this earlier. It's been in our rep literally all eight years of our existence as a group. Um, we've championed this piece. <laughs> <laughs> it's written by our good friend Jesse Montgomery, who is a wonderful composer based here in New York City. And... Um, before we play that, I just want to acknowledge the two learning groups that came out today and played. Uh, it takes a lot to play in front of people mm -hmm. and a camera, and so I think we should just... Uh, Thank you. 
kind of initiated, but we're, we think of ourselves as a band, so we kind of all did it together in a way. It's um, uh, Astro Piazzolla's Libertango. My dad is a jazz tuba player, and uh, I was, we did a recording a little while back, and he loves the music of Astro Piazzolla. So we eventually played with him and his jazz band, and we started improvising together, and I did an arrangement for a quartet and jazz ensemble. So we're missing some players here, um, <laughs> but we'll try to fill in for them. I love the music of uh, Astor Piazzolla. We're super interested in music that's kind of in between genres, in between um, times and cultures. Astor Piazzolla took the, the very kind of structured and formulated tango and kind of paired it with the harmony and um, dissonance of both jazz and classical music. So he took those two things and matched them together. And so we're trying to capture that. There'll be some improvisation, as there was in the last piece. Um, yeah, so this is Astro Piazzolla's Libertango.
Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you're curious, publicquartet.com, ACMP. Uh, keep the conversation going online. Uh, hashtag ACMP Chamber Music, is that right? And um, at ACMP Chamber Music on Facebook. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and playing for you. Thank you very much. incorporate these fantastic pieces into your repertoire. Uh, the session will be available on our website. And um, the next, the next programs coming up at ACMP are our worldwide chamber music weekend, our playing weekend. So we'll circle the globe with chamber music on March 3rd and 4th. And then soon after that, we'll have our new workshop guide, which has workshop listings for adult amateurs all over the world. So you can play all summer long if you want to. So uh, you, can, you can check us out online, you can join, you can find out about membership, and make a donation or whatever you like at acmp.net. And a huge thank you to Public Quartet for being with us this afternoon, to our two student quartets, the One O'Clock Manor String Quartet and, um, and Augmented Four, to Laura Mount, the, uh, the coach for the Manus Group, and to our board, staff, volunteers, the ACMP Foundation, Virtual Arts TV, and the National Opera Centre. And to all our ACMP members everywhere, keep playing.